Susan. Just put it on the stand for now. Uh, okay. All right. On, on here. Well, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, I can. Can you hear me? You hear all right now? Too well? Is that any better? Is that better? I'll try to talk a little louder. <laughs> Go like that. But I, I'll introduce my husband. He's allowed to tell me to get quiet. <laughs> um, my husband, Harold, is in the back there, and he served in his country, the United States Marines. <laughs> you might wonder why I'm dressed uh, something in similar to a Navy uniform or Navy-related attire, and that's in tribute to my own father, who served in World War II, um, as far as he was concerned, there was nothing like the PBYs, and he served both in the North Atlantic and the South Pacific. Uh, he enlisted when he was 16, sort of fudged about the age a little bit, was uh, signed in 1940, before we actually declared war in December of 41, was assigned to the North Atlantic in the Iceland region. He said that was so frigid. Then December, 41 occurred, um, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and he was immediately shipped to the South Pacific. And I said to him one day, I said, which was the worst of the two? Which was the worst? And he said, by far, the North Atlantic. <laughs> so he was in from 40 to 46. Actually, he could have come out in 1944, but the Navy said, you would be well qualified to teach future young men to fly. So they repositioned him then in Jacksonville, Florida as an aviation mechanic there and taught young men to fly. As I was coming through here from the high school where we were at uh, Springfield, I saw such uh, beautiful homes and territory and so many things that you think of as being typically of the Philadelphia, greater Philadelphia area saw some of the horse country out around there too. And I thought, boy, this whole place just reeks of history from almost the very instant our country was founded. And how grateful you should be for facilities like this library for, uh, um, and all the things that they've allowed you to do here. I'm sorry if this session does come to an end in December. I, I'm hoping and praying maybe somebody could step up the plate and at least do it every other month if you can't meet every month, it's so important. Um, we'll begin here just as a little um, introduction to you. I've written three books. The first two books would, it, would be the generation that would have been the parents of the World War II generation. Now those were the people who came through their lives doing everything by hand. A lot of them, technology really hadn't reached them in the way my grandfather used to call technology, which was meaning having a, a tractor that had wheels. <laughs> because they were the steam threshermen. They were the, they were the generation that finally got it all together. We had the Industrial Revolution, late 1800s, early 1900s. These people came along. So my first two books are on stories of rural people. Uh, have the most interesting anecdotes. The only thing I insisted upon any of the books I've written would be that they would be historically correct. 
you'll see in the next slide here, um, the primary storytellers come from central Pennsylvania. But the book is all about all of Pennsylvania. Because it might be that there was a GI or a nurse or somebody that went in from central Pennsylvania, but they served under the same circumstances with the buddy in the foxhole or whatever next to them, and he could have been from Philadelphia, Abington, Pittsburgh, wherever. And it's a tribute to those on the battlefronts as well as to those on the home front. And the one thing I wanted to do is to collect stories that had never been told before. And I wanted to not only show the accuracy of the military part of it, but I wanted to show the human interest part of it as well. Uh, whenever I did any interviews or I got any resource material, I always tried to get it as close to the World War II years as possible. And when I interviewed people uh, for my primary uh, storytellers, they were always World War II veterans. I didn't hear it from so-and-so who told so-and-so. I went straight to the source. This was the, the source that I used. It was a little pamphlet put out and published in 1946. This shows Pennsylvania at war. And I got permission to use that. OK, now here's one thing that I, I found interesting when I started uh, my research going prior to going into the war. Of course, the war we know was already going on in, in the European front and so forth. But here on the home front in the 1930s, our boys were doing something a little different. They had joined the CCC in many occasions in order to help provide funding for, for their families, and especially those that might have been from the coal mining region because there was a really, really, really deep depression in that area. The man who's driving happens to be my uh, late uncle, Harold Taylor. And even then, even though they all had jobs on the CCC, Conservation Corps, uh, building parks, building roadways through parks, um, uh, doing things like down the, along the, the Ray Cavern and uh, the highway in that area, um, they couldn't afford a car. So they all went together to buy a car so that when they could come home, they were allowed to come home. Now, if you look at any of those young gentlemen in there, you won't see one person that's overweight. They were all physically fit and ready to go into war when we declared war in 1941. And I often say, and I said this one time when I was uh, teaching, it just came to the top of my head when I was teaching in a Sunday school class, I wonder how great our nation would have been during World War II if we hadn't had the depression and seasoned people, these young people, to learn to do without to learn to be unselfish. What if it was today's generation, and they're not all this way, but what if it was the me first generation? I think it took hard circumstances, like the Depression, like the CCC camp, to build in the wolf and fiber of the World War II generation, which many consider, and I consider, the most unself unselfish generation that ever lived. This is just the barracks of the CCC. I took. I have this just to show you this one did have heat. It, most of them did not have heat. And there's snowstorms that come up three and four foot around the outside of the windows. I have up pictures, but I couldn't have room for all them. And there was no heat. Okay. Now that's the dispensary, the CC C dispensary in Lancaster. We'll just move rather quickly along here. Dr. Robert Parker Banks was, was, some, was from Mifflintown area and he served in two world wars. He was uh, just in residency as, as in the first world war and then he served in World War II. Quite a handsome person. Major General Homer M. Greniger was the one who dispatched all materials from the New York Harbor port. And it was nothing like we had ever seen before. One man in charge of everything what was needed overseas, the supplies, the ammunition, everything that went out of New York Harbor for our servicemen went through this man, and there were no computers. This is the general's dream home. When he went, came home, my grandfather built the general's dream home. So we always felt we, we had to walk past the general's dream home when we were in high school, and I could always say my grandfather worked, built, built that home. Here was another um, uh, family that had uh, doctors, and this particular one, Penrose Shelley, was in World War I. 
and then his son was in World War II. And this is the publish of the uh, published in 46. I had already mentioned this, Pennsylvania War. Now there were some advantages to blackouts. <laughs> and here this sailor is wasting no time. Rosie the Riveter. Many of you probably have been to the farm show at one time or other in your life, but many of you might not know that part of that was used as aviation school, and women went in there every day of their lives during World War II and fixed airplanes and also learned how to repair airplane engines. And some of the men who were physically not able to go into the service also were there. But by and large, it was the women who worked on the airplane itself and the engines at that particular site. Okay, another instrument of war, which we wouldn't really normally think of as being an instrument of war, was the tractor during World War II. Because all of our um, allies had been in the war since the 1930s. They had no harvest fields. Most of France and England and all those places had been without a plentiful supply of food from the late 1930s on. So when, Amer and even before America entered the war, we were shipping vast, vast, vast sums of grain and uh, food products to the European, European nations. Now, one of the reasons we had harmony on the home front, even though we had rationing, we never did without. We always had food. Um, and the reason that was is because the farmers stepped up to the plate. Uh, World War II, during World War II in 1940, before we got into the war, um, officially, we had taken a census. And Uncle Sam said to the family farmer, once we entered World War II, for every 12 acres you have in production now, you have to come up with an, uh, an extra acre to, for production. And that was so we could supply everybody on the home front, all of our troops overseas, all over the world, plus all the free nations. And at home, a lot of the farm work was done by women and younger sons. The older sons usually went to war. If it was a family with a number of sons, usually the first two sons went to war. The younger sons stayed home on the farm. The mothers, aunts, grandmothers, and were in the fields. This just shows you, we'll go rather quickly here, some of the Veterans Day parades. This is in Dillsburg, Pennsylvania, but this is a part of Americana, would be anybody's Main Street, USA. And this is in Marysville, Pennsylvania. Uh, the whole towns would come out and celebrate the soldiers. Steelton, Pennsylvania. We'll stop just a second there. Steelton was very, very important. And that's, any of you know, it's not too far from Harrisburg. Steelton was very important. Bethlehem Steel was very important because they did produce steel for World War II. And most of, um, a good many of the uh, railroad tracks over Europe were bombed by the, the Germans. So they produced the rails that went into the manufacturing of uh, replacing those over in Europe. I was fortunate enough to interview Mr. Glenn Bowers from Dillsburg. He was in the Black Sheep Squadron. I went directly to the source. And um, even his hometown could never get an interview out of him for the hometown newspaper. And I kept trying to get a home. Uh, um, a story from him and I kept calling him and nobody returned my messages. Well here after the war when he returned to the States he went on and used the GI Bill went through Penn State and uh, he learned he had learned to fly in the cow pastures of Penn State uh, before the war and they wouldn't let him in and then as soon as Pearl Harbor was bombed anybody that flew in the cow pastures of Penn State were more than welcome to come in immediately and that shows him today and this shows him when he was in his uh, aviation gear. The reason he gave me um, the chance to interview him was he says, I want to set the record straight. And uh, I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, those flimsy stories, those man-made stories, made-up stories, historically incorrect stories, were all on the Black Sheep television show. And I wanted to make, he said, we had enough going on, enough excitement, enough escapades, not of our own choosing, but of things malfunctioning in airplanes and so forth, that they would not have had to make up one story if they would have just taken the time to interview actual World War II veterans. They would have had enough for all their stories. 
So that's the reason he gave me the interview, because he said he wanted to set the record straight. This is um, signed autograph to Glenn from <clears throat> Poppy Boynton. This is the real Poppy Boynton, not the one that was on uh, TV. And he served in, the, they served primarily in the South Pacific area. Um, my dad was one, on one side of the islands with the Navy, and um, Poppy Boynton and the Black Sheep Squad were on the other side of the islands. And this just shows the, the Con Air uh, airplane in the South Pacific with the palm trees. And um, I guess I can walk with this. This is Poppy Boynton. He always had to be front and center. And then this is Mr. Bowers here. That's his picture he was holding. Nice looking gentleman. Okay, Sergeant William, or we, they called him Wild Bill, Wild Bill Donnelly, was from the Lebanon area. And um, he thought he was going to be a professional uh, boxer. In fact, he had won quite a few tournaments and he was down in the Philadelphia area. He was going on to become a professional boxer. That's what he had his goal set for. And Uncle Sam tapped him on the shoulder during World War II and said, you will be the bodyguard of General uh, Roosevelt. Because of his physique and uh, the other uh, things that they taught him when he was in there, he was chosen to be General Teddy Roosevelt's bodyguard. Now, I don't know if this is a little bit dark here. Here's Pat, and in the background is uh, the bodyguard, Mr. Donnelly, and over here is uh, Teddy Roosevelt. And we don't hear a lot about him in history, and even in our history books, because he died just shortly after the war, so they didn't make a lot of stories uh, and have a lot of documentaries about him. But no matter where General Roosevelt went, um, Donnelly got to meet all the major generals during World War II. He was like a fly on the wall watching everything going on. This is a newspaper clipping, that's the reason that's dark. And this is uh, the Teddy uh, Roosevelt Jr. His um, father had been president in the early part of the, of the 19th century. His father wasn't, I have to explain to the younger generation, his father wasn't Franklin Delano Roosevelt. <laughs> And this is Mr. Donnelly later in life. Now, um, when he came out of the war, his nerves had been pretty well frazzled, and I'll give you a couple instances and then you'll understand why. Um, everywhere that the general went, he was. And General Roosevelt was so tenderhearted towards his troop, even though he came from what we would call American aristocracy, uh, well-known family back in those days, like the Kennedys would be like in today's world, uh, what happened was, he was so down to earth, General Roosevelt, that when he ever, whenever he felt that his troops might be in danger, like on a battlefield or maybe somebody was advancing towards them, he would sleep on the floorboards of, the, of his Jeep. And so this poor soul had to stay awake day and night because he was guarding the general. And so he would go for days with uh, sleep deprivation. P-R-I-V-A-T-I-O. <laughs> Deprived of sleep. It did uh, uh, affect his nerves. But he came out of, and went to the VA hospital. They had some treatment and so forth, and he was honorably discharged. But what was so neat about that, he took the negative, what somebody might say is negative, or what life dealt me, and he turned it into a positive. And all his life, he worked with disabled American veterans. And he just, they just loved him and his wife. They served faithfully at the Lebanon County VA Hospital. And they were just angels to other people. This is Terry Allen. And then and this is a, a close-up picture of uh, Teddy Roosevelt Jr. Now this is what was so amazing to me was that it, it, people would come from a real peaceful farm setting. And, and they would go from there halfway around the world when most of them had never been out of their own county. Halfway around the world. No emails. Even the mails and the newspapers got there maybe sometime six months uh, later than what it was written. But I've set this up to show you this next section is going to be about a nurse who was trained in Philadelphia to become an RN at the Presbyterian Hospital down here. 
and this was her home farm. She had never been out of her county, and she went for nurses training, and they said about along about 1940, oh, we need a lot of nurses, the American Red Cross said, to become volunteers. We need volunteers. We need volunteers. Well, the American Red Cross had the foresight to see that it would be just a matter of time till our boys and gals' blood would be shed abroad and who were going to take care of them. And so this so-called voluntary service that they were to be in for one year, what happened? We declared war in the meantime, and they were drafted. So uh, this, she went from this scene here being among some of the worst of the war-torn areas of her generation. Can't see that too well, but it just shows uh, it was her uh, War Department ID, which she had to be worn at all times. Born in 1918. Before she was shipped overseas, um, she was first shipped um, south, and um, this is a map that she made that showed the railroad ma maps where they ship boys who were too ill to stay in the service or whatever were shipped and doctored and taken back towards Pennsylvania. But she was originally in the, in the Georgia area. One of these that has a laser pointer on it. Oh, that's okay. All right. That's all right. <laughs> Next. Yes, please. And this is her picture. Beautiful woman, and she's still beautiful. She's still living today, and um, beautiful inside and outside. What was so amazing about so many of the World War II veterans, when they came out of the war, they were just as dedicated all their lives to being good, civil, upright servants to the public as they were being patriotic servants of the country when they were in the war. And oh, for a generation like that again. Um, and she's all of her life then, when she came out of the war, she was in nursing, she, went, uh, she was a head of the visiting nurses, she established the visiting nurses in two counties, she was with the American Red Cross, and her father couldn't understand why she did all this stuff. He says, well, they should at least pay you when she first started out doing all these things voluntarily. Now, the, the night before she was to be shipped overseas, and this was done with the medical corps and the nurses and some of the enlisted people who were officers and so forth, on the left side, you'll see Kate there, the nurse, and that was the man she was supposed to marry. That was the one she was engaged to marry. And over here is another doctor and a nurse, her best friend, and uh, unfortunately, she was never able to marry him because he was killed during World War II. And she never married until she was age 55 then. So she never had children. And so you realize what people gave up. You know, it wasn't just a case of going over, serving a year or two, and then coming home, or putting in a year here or six months there, and have an email every day. I'm not belittling that, uh, but I'm saying a lot of people sacrifice their whole lives and their whole future. Just show some pictures here. The hospital trains were composed of six box cars, and here's Kate looking out of one box car there in the middle, and the four close, closer up, pic, closer pictures. Um, the hospital trains cover went around the hub of Paris, France, and then they were called out in different directions. It's composed of six box cars, and then there were three litters high in each each box car in case somebody was too severely hurt and they were taken back across the English Channel. So on these six box cars, there had to be four nurses, two doctors, and one pharmacist. And the reason they had to have a pharmacist was, in that day and age, you couldn't pre-make the pharmaceutical products. They had to be mixed right there, even a penicillin and some of the other things. Now, before I leave this section here, I want to assure you there were a lot of good things came out of World War II, and one of them was it made our country start doing medical research. Before World War II, there was nothing in the way of medical research. And the American Red Cross, we have to give them a lot of credit because prior to World War II, as far as our declaring uh, war with Japan and so forth, uh, they realized that sooner or later our boys would be overseas. And what were we going to do? We had no way of preserving blood yet. So they did the research. They came up the way of the way of preserving blood, and they also came up with a way. Before it was just from my arm to your arm, your arm for a blood transfusion, but 
there would have been a lot more people died on Normandy beaches and elsewhere if the Red Cross hadn't come up and found out how to transport and preserve blood. This is just a little bit of humor in a way. You see here she made $33 that year. <laughs> Military hasn't changed much. They still underpay a lot of things. But the reason I have this one, I didn't put the other one up I'll be referring to. Do you see that in 1943, it was called the victory tax return up there at the top? We were so sure, well, our politicians were so sure that we were going to go in and whip them, and it was all going to be over with in a year or two at the most. Now, by this time, we had been in three years. Well, you know, if you can't, well, you can't really count 41 because it was December. Okay, but this time we were in two years, 42 and 43. We were so sure we still could just whip them. But if you looked, and I have a copy of a 1944 tax return for her, and it didn't say victory tax return. It went back to the old way of just individual income tax return. So many times we came so close to losing that it was only the good Lord's hand on us as a country, I just personally believe that, that would make a divine intervention here. Okay. The, this is the hospital train route, and right in here is Paris, France, and it's, everything else is in French, so you probably, unless you took French, wouldn't know it anyway. You see there's sort of a hub around Paris, France. This is a railroad map, and these are all the areas that they would be called out. They'd hear of a battle one day, and then start immediately with the hospital trains to cover those areas. Uh, oh, by the way, I wanted to tell you, in that 1944 tax return that I don't have a slide for, every cent she made, the year before she, the nurse made $33, the next year, everything she made the whole year went to war bonds. She made zero on her tax return. Okay, this just shows you a little bit. I just wanted to have uh, some of the tube day pass uh, issue to show you some of them old typewriter type things. And this uh, uh, Vince, Vincent Penvalini, was from the Philadelphia area, and that would have been the man she would have married if he had lived, but he was killed. It just shows some more um, photo ID. Like that hairdo she had there? <laughs> That's when she was just fresh off the farm. <laughs> and this is a matinee every once in a while. Now, I have to tell you about their shifts during World War II. They worked six hours, they slept six hours. They worked six hours, they slept six hours. They did that year after year around the clock. The nurses did. There was such a shortage. So it wasn't a case where you had any days off. If you were promoted like she was, then maybe once a year, you would be given a day or two off, and then you could go into Paris, France, and see all the activities that were there. But when you consider that there were years went by that they worked six hours, slept six hours, worked six hours, slept, they never had 24-hour period where they could just call their own. And then that, this is a map, this was the front cover of a map of Paris. They had no way, being on the farm, have no idea what Paris, France was, took French, could read a little bit, back in those days, but they took their map of Paris and headed in for their holiday. And when she came home, I'm going to finish up this section here in a little bit, but when she came home, things had changed so drastically, her weight and everything, she got thinner and so forth, she had no suit to wear. That was, she had to have an official picture taken after the war for a post-war something a medal or whatever, so she borrowed her sister's suit. This was, came from Harry Truman, um, thanking her for the uh, fortitude, resourcefulness, and calm judgment necessary for the tasks that she did uh, serving on the hospital train. That's her today. She's still as bright as a tack, and she can still wear a uniform. <laughs> oh, I, I don't believe I told this group. Um, when I had everything ready, I have so much information about her because I feel that some ways women have been underrepresented, uh, underrepresented in World War II. So I wanted to make sure then when I did have a World War II person still around, 
of the feminine gender. I wanted to get as much information as I could. And um, she told me so much about everything that uh, I would just want to, I don't know if you can read all this, but served in the United States for 34 months. This is some of her, her recognition. And in European theater for 26 months, assigned to Station Hospital, Fort Benning, Georgia, charged nurse of officers, medical ward for one year and of officers surgical ward for one year, chief nurse of the 25th hospital train, evacuating wounded from forward areas to base hospitals in England, France, Germany, Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg, responsible for supervision of three nurses and 32 medical corpsmen, also responsible for all administrative work, no computers, also responsible for all administrative work such as maintenance of records, requisitions and issue of medical supplies, medical treatment, and general welfare of the patients. That's the last, uh, listed last. Um, received efficiency rating of superior during entire overseas tour of duty. Um, just, just the other side of that um, thing which shows that she was uh, head nurse uh, 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 in the Presbyterian Hospital here in Philadelphia. And from what she studied, we can see she evidently pl had planned to have children of her own, but then the man was killed in the, the war. Just some more of her recognitions and, and uh, military record. And that's the separation papers there. One, one thing I really appreciated about this nurse is since she had no children, she just gave me her whole scrapbook. And she had two or three scrapbooks full of all this information. And one of them, there was a little pamphlet about that high by about that size. And she was the one that alerted me. She said, Sue, I don't know if you really want this or not. And my ears perked up right away. But she said, I have a story of the, medic um, of the medical service of the ETO, e European Theater of War. Would you like to have that to review too? And I said, you betcha I would. So that's where I learned about all the informa a lot of the information. It changed medical history. Just shows you uh, the huts they used. Uh, they had to ha uh, operate in complete darkness except for some of those overhead lights because of the bombings in the, the area. And this was invading the beaches of Normandy, bringing in supplies and so forth after it had been invaded. And this whole little booklet was a, um, uh, a tribute to the Chief Surgeon General Hawley. And um, it, he was like, among the medical corps, he was like the most revered person in the whole war. Back then, they weren't allowed to be given um, medals. And they weren't allowed to be given like Purple Hearts and so forth, because when they took that Hippocratic Oath, they had said they would lay down their life for their fellow men. And, but now you can get those, you can get recognition. Just shows you some more of the evacuation hospital and, and that's a tent there again, very poor lighting. And then that shows a nurse and so forth on the job there. Okay, this is um, Red Cross facilities receiving the first class or first casualties. And you can see these are like uh, tents and the, what they would call field hospitals. And then, of course, I was glad in this because uh, in this little pamphlet, it did pay tribute to the Army nurse. And this was on the, uh, this was on the back of the uh, little pamphlet, the wounded get back. That was the number one goal, to make sure our boys could come home. There, I have a couple stories in here about two prisoners of war, and there's an interesting twist to this. That's a grandma with two grandsons. And both of the grand, one grandson lived across the street from the other grandson in the same town, and they both became prisoners of war. Different places. They didn't enlist together or anything like that, but different places. And I'm thinking, those of us who are grandmothers, could you stand to have two of your grandchildren as a POW at the same time? There's a lot of sacrifice going on, not only on the battlefield, but in the home front as well. And the churches were fuller than they've ever been during that time, and prayers were continually going up. Now, I get to on the home stretch here. <laughs> this is a Taylor Wirt. Um, my mother and dad married 60 years, 
I consider my mother to be a war bride. Uh, like I said, my dad enlisted in 40, and his enlistment would have been up in 44. But Uncle Sam said, um, we really need you to train the younger guys coming in here. So how about if we ship you back to the Jacksonville Naval Base, and you can train the guys to the end of your enlist enlistment, second enlistment. So he enlisted for two more years. So then my mother took a train down, met my dad. They were married down there. And being the good sailor my dad was, I came along nine months and 12 days later. <laughs> That's a wedding picture there. It wasn't time for big weddings that, that you just got married. And, and I just want to insert this. At different times when I have question and answer periods, the younger people particularly, and sometimes reporters will ask me, what do you attribute long marriages to for those who married during the war years? And I said, they wrote to each other every day. They put their commitment on paper every day. They made a pledge to one another. They to not only told each other that they loved them, but it was written down. And I think somehow that's a whole lot more thinking through process than just saying a flippant I love you when the person's next door to you. Now that's just my personal opinion, but I think that was one of the things that attributed to my mom and dad's marriage for 60 years. And they're still both living. And this book's in tribute to them. Um, there's my dad as a 16-year-old. Look at his physique then. Pretty scrawny kid. 18 months later as a seasoned sailor. Big difference, isn't there? And it's not just because it's a up-close picture, but he filled out. And my mother often said he went from a boy to being a man during World War II when he was in the Navy. Now the women also had, uh, I don't know whether if you ever can uh, rent a video, rent a league of their own. It's about how the women took up the slack in baseball and softball when the men were off to war during World War II. It's a very good video, and most of it's pretty wholesome uh, by my standard anyway. Um, it's hard to get anything that's 100% wholesome. But there's my mother in the upper left-hand corner, the second one in from the left, without the glasses there. That was the carefree, happy class of May 1941. Okay, then the war came in December. Quite a difference. We call that the class that went to war. She only had about 19 people in her high school graduating class and two were killed. During the war, in order to cup keep up the morale at home, the young women were, and this is my mother's picture here, were um, encouraged to keep the home front happy and take their mind off of so much things they were seeing in movie documentaries and so forth of the, store, of the war. So they were encouraged to go into the softball. And they actually had um, professional baseball teams with women, which will show you in that video a league of their own. I always thought my mom was in a league of her own, and then I have found a picture and found out for sure. These were the two men, um, not the pictures, but this was in tribute to George Landis and Jim Robinson. One was killed in the Baton Death March in my mother's graduating class, and uh, James Robinson was killed in the Battle of the Bulge. Once again, some pictures, not because I think my family is the most wonderful family in the world, but I think it was typical. I think it, a lot of people could relate to them. Uh, my dad in his air aviation uniform, my mom and dad when he's home on leave taking a picture to county fair, and then my dad at age 16, you can know, oh, he has a skinny waistline there. <laughs> And this is sort of cute because it was neat to be dressed alike. So my mother cut off a long coat and made a short jacket so she would match my dad in uniform. I like the old car. Then, um, like I said, um, nine months and 12 days later, I came along to Jacksonville, Florida. And I then, call on eight nine. And then I call 20, on eight nine. 22 Thank months you. after that, my sister came along. Now, what was interesting about this, and I'm sure some of you could relate to this, uh, was that when they were in the war and writing to each other every day, they were telling each other, whether they were sweethearts or married, well, we're going to have this little love nest when we get home. We're going to just be so happy. We're going to come home. and it, They were going to live the American dream. Okay, we'll look at the next couple pictures here. 
here was our honeymoon. Well, no, this wasn't our first honeymoon shack. Most kids, when I say kids, I shouldn't say kids. Most of uh, many, many, many of the people who came home from war ended up, they had to go to housekeeping with mom and dad. That's not much of a honeymoon cottage, is it? When they finally could get housing or find a car because there was such a shortage of cars, we had, my, our aunt found this little place, and if you see on the left-hand side, there's an outhouse. <laughs> I never even knew that till we just got these pictures enlarged. But I, I spent most of my life in that backyard. But it did lead to the American dream because my mom and dad wanted to get out of that place so badly that they built their own house, block by block. My mom mixed all the mud and the mortar, and my dad laid every block. And uh, they just moved out of that house and downsized about a year ago. It was really hard because they had their blood, sweat, and tears in that house. And that's just a picture of my, my sister and, and me. You know, the baby boomers, a lot of them happened right after the war. When <laughs> So I think that's a fairly typical, too. A couple things here about the PBY Catalinas, as far as my dad was concerned. Like I said, they were the only airplane worth mentioning. Of course, you know, World War II veterans know, they can land both on air and sea. What? Air? Oh, land on <laughs> land and sea, sorry. And on the top um, picture there is my dad loading some wreaths where they were going to have a tribute to some people, to some sailors who had lost their lives in the North Atlantic. I, ha I like this picture for a lot of reasons because it, it doesn't show up very well right here because we had too many lights on, but it shows the costumes of that time. Huh? Oh, I don't know. Can you turn the lights off? Can we turn the lights down a little bit? A little bit? Or, uh, it's, it's all. We're almost through anyway but um we'll try it for the next mission <laughs> yeah that's better yeah but you see the old time shoes and the dresses and my sister and i used to to walk in those shoes we play misses and, and use those world war ii shoes okay uh this is one of the things my dad got it, it was sort of um a humorous thing but it was also a privilege to get it and then on the left side there, once again, is my dad when he was in the North Atlantic, and then he was shipped to the South Pacific. And that's his bars up there, too. Now, while he wasn't in the, in the submarine aspect of the war, he was in the aviation, my grandfather, his dad, kept a scrapbook during World War II. And anything that he thought my dad would be interested in when he came home from the war, he wanted to show him. So he had this saved for my dad in the scrapbook. And, then, and a lot of these were launched in, in Lake Erie because the government wanted them inland. They didn't want a lot of them to be launched along the, uh, the Atlantic or the Pacific because that would be too easy a target. So a lot of these were launched in the Lake Erie area. And then most everybody by now has heard of the Band of Brothers. If you watch the History Channel at all, seems like it's on there quite a lot. And Dick Winters, uh, who I, whom I know personally and lives in Hershey, just uh, a number of miles away from us. Um, if you've never had a chance to see that series, be sure to see it. And uh, I guess you can buy videos of it too. But he was, he was the one that was left in charge of his company after the leading officer went AWOL. And Mr. Winters, and he was never trained at West Point or anything like that. Mr. Winters thought up some strategic plans that were so unique that they're even used by West Point today. Uh, in the back part of my book, I do pay a little bit of tribute to the other forms of uh, war machinery, because like I said, the tractors were used to produce food so we could all live. Uh, this just shows that there was a picture commissioned by the government, just like it, you would see um, posters, posters commissioned to join the Air Force, Navy, and so forth, Army. Well, this was the farmer's poster. And it shows that if he's doing his patriotic duty, that he would be producing enough food to feed all those countries represented by flags of the free world at that time. And of course, he had to do it on a tractor <laughs> that didn't have rubber. 
because all the rubber went to the war effort. So that shows the farm show where the um, State School of Aeronautics was. And it graduated 12,330 persons just in two years' time. So you know they were really putting people through there day and night. I don't know, this might be unique to our area. I, I hope it's not. I hope they do this to other places as well. I'm going to talk about this picture first, the color picture. But in our locale, they award high school diplomas to the guys who left school that didn't get their, their graduation diplomas because they feel they have contributed so much to our society, these World War II veterans, and they garnered and saw half the world in their time that they are well worthy to be appreciated. And then the other picture above there, the old black and white picture, that's on my mother's side of the family, the Taylor brothers plus my grandfather's in the middle. Some of the men who wanted to go to the war weren't allowed to because they were steel workers. My grandfather would have been too old probably, but one of my uncles had to stay home because he was a steel worker and we needed that steel. And then the other uncle worked at the American Visco and that was the parachute uh, material used, used for parachutes. So some of the men, their patriotic duty actually was on the home front. Okay. Okay, just leave that on. And if you have questions, I'll, you want to take over the question and answer period? Thank you very much, Susan. Uh -huh. Any questions? Let's, let's try one over here. Explain the, explain the function of the PBY. Oh, okay. Well, the main function that my dad, I'm not pro pro proclaiming to be an expert, but the main function that my dad uh, flew in them was to pick up people who had been downed at sea. And they would land on the water and pick up these uh, people who were stranded on the sea and bring them back and uh, whatever needed to be done with them, why they, they would do it. But it was really, really invaluable, especially in the South Pacific, where there were so many islands, and also there were no airports. <laughs> there were no place to land on some of these uh, places. You had, if there were places to land, it was only midway to, towards the end of the war because the, the, the people had to go in and build the air landing places. Maybe you can add to that. Do you have anything additional? Okay. Yes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Questions but they could land here. near enough the islands that they could help uh, that way when no other plane could land. Hey, well, we're we're going to go to this side now, right. if you don't mind. Anybody over here? Okay. You got it. Did you ever hear them referred to as Goonie Birds? <laughs> oh, yes. You know, they always said ugly ducklings. They called them ugly ducklings, too. They had all kinds of names for the PBYs. And here, my mother and I ran across this piece. It was a poem, and it was written um, anonymously, and it was called Handsome Is. And it's all about the PBY. And what it says is, well, some people, in other words, call us ugly ducklings. But if you're down at sea, and we're your only source of, of rescue, you think we're pretty handsome. <laughs> it was really cute. <laughs> okay, next question. They did a lot of uh, patrol work on the East Coast looking for submarines, German submarines. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were able to uh, observe them and get down close enough and observe them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I wasn't in the Navy. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Next question. Do you remember the days when they used to have people outside, put those lights out, do this, do that? Mm -hmm. And the gasoline bag you had on your car, you could have get around with it. Mm -hmm. Sputter wasn't around. Foods were a very short supply. Mm -hmm. but you everybody was working like a Steve McGarvey. Mm -hmm. They were the days. Yes. And the other thing is, too, I told the um, the people at the uh, high school here that I spoke at one o'clock, uh, your football f field would be plowed up if you were during World War II. They plowed up parks, they plowed up baseball fields, football fields, anything they could plow. Everything had to go in for that victory garden. 
and they really they really encouraged housewife, housewives to do their own canning and preserving because everybody had to come up with their as much as food as possible for their own families. Next question. Uh, Susan, what did your father actually do on the PBY? Apparently he wasn't a pilot, but what were his duties on the PBY? Okay, with the PBY, the, but he also fixed all other kinds of aircraft because he's a machinist aviator. Um, back then, I don't know if it's this way now, but back then, before a pilot could take any aircraft up, he had to get the permission that everything was A-OK -okay with the, the um, the machinist, the aviation machinist, the one who actually worked on the airplane, worked on the engines and everything. If the aviator machinist said, no, you can't go, it's not ready, or I don't feel that, that it, it's prime, then they didn't go. So the, actually, in a way, the aviation machinist had more say on when the uh, pilot was going to fly than the pilot himself. And then he did repair work, too, on the engines. Mm -hmm. Next question. But he also did, he was a gunner too. He, he was, he did other things. He flew, he flew on missions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought I saw a hand in here, but I guess I didn't. <laughs> well, Susan? I'd just like to ask a question if I could. Okay. Are there any uh, World War II veterans in here that served on more than one front? Like he served, my dad served in the North Atlantic and the South Pacific. You did? Which? In the North Atlantic and the Pacific. You were? Okay. All right. I have a. I, convoys. Convoys? Okay. All right. Mm hmm. All right. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I appreciate uh, having you come out in the middle of the day. And uh, I like to share my story with uh, the World War II veterans, but they already know the story. But I'd like to assure them that I also really appreciate being able to share it with, um, like I did with the juniors in high school. And I'm really encouraging them, you might get bugged about this, to go interview their family members who were in World War II. Get everything, either audio or video, and they can all, always later on turn it into a written, uh, something written. Thank you.